Rejoice in the Lord, all ye righteousness, for praise is coming for the upright. Praise the Lord with hearts, sing unto him the sorcery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with loud noises. Second Baptist and friends, a couple of brief notes. Let's continue to stay in prayer uh, for our own Sick and Shut-In members and for all of our church members in general. We want to remind you to please take advantage of our online Sunday school and our various prayer lines. Also take advantage of our Wednesday 6 p.m. Bible class. Very interesting. We're presently studying the topic, the second coming of Jesus. I'll remind you that we're moving closer to the opening of our church. We'll be back in our sanctuary, we thank God. Some preparations have to be made, and as I've asked before, be ready to volunteer if you call called upon. For some things have to be done to, uh, before we enter back into our sanctuary. Finally, we know that there's still a lot of unrest in our nation, and even around the world with respect to social justice and other things that are going on. Keep in prayer for all of those persons who are affected by COVID-19 for those persons who are in recovery, for the medical people who are helping them. And also, let's continue to be supportive morally and in prayer with respect to the great efforts for social justice in our land. There's much still going on, but we at Second Baptist, we have a long history of being supportive of social justice, and we want to just keep that on the forefront of our thinking. Be in prayer and be supportive of all, of all efforts to have all of God's children be treated like God wanted them to be treated. Thank you very much. You can now request prayer from our website. For those with an email address, you will be sent the link to the form as well. Please share if you know someone in need of prayer. This is from the Deacon Board. To locate the prayer request form on our website, go to www.secondbaptistdetroit.org and look in the upper right hand corner. There, you will find a link called Prayer Requests. Click that link and a form will come up for you to fill out. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Thank you for the opportunity to return to you just a portion of the blessings you have given to us. Lord, magnify and multiply these blessings, Lord, so that they may be used to uplift your kingdom. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time of sharing your word. I pray now, God, that the Holy Spirit will uh, work through this, thy humble servant, to bring forth the word of God that it might be pleasing to the people of God. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, the scriptural background for my sharing today is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, and I will be commenting on at least partially verses 11 to 13 and verses 20 to 24. Luke 15, verses 11 to 13 and verses 20 to 24. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And the father divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in loose living. Those are verses 11 to 13. Now I'm going to read verses 20 to 24. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. And they began to make merry. My subject is a loving and forgiving father. A loving and forgiving father. Today is Father's Day in our country and in 111 countries around the world. It's a time of honoring fatherhood. It's an important day on the calendar. First celebrated on June 19, 1910 in the state of Washington. It's a day for recognizing the influence of fathers in the family and in society. It's a time to remember the fathers who lived out their appointed days and who have gone on to glory. It's also a time to remember the fathers whose lives were cut short by gun violence and other life-shortening means. And today, we also remember the thousands of fathers who are incarcerated around the country. Recent statistics show that in our country there are over 2,300,000 men in federal and state prisons. Many of these men are fathers. We recognize them also today, even though they cannot be with their families. May God hasten today when they will be reunited with their families. And now I want to join the chorus of many voices in speaking a word of appreciation to the many fathers who have and are fulfilling their role as fathers. It has always been God's will and design for fathers to play a key role and function in the family. Almost from the beginning of human history, God had in mind what came to be called the nuclear family, which is composed of a father and a mother and a child or children, the nuclear family. The nuclear family, to use another expression, was to be the building block of society. So all through history, the family has been looked upon as a unit, a series of units, along with zillions of other units, which populate the world. And key to this building block was and is the father. From biblical history on, the father was looked upon as the head of the family. Also, from earliest times, he was considered the principal breadwinner. To use another metaphor, at some point in time, the saying came about that the father brought home the bacon. Also in biblical history, 
in the Jewish family, the father was considered to be the spiritual leader of the family. It was he who fostered and nurtured the spiritual life of the family. We see this in the lives of the patriarchs, such as Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and their later personalities such as Job. They were exemplary family heads. These were men who displayed the heart and character of fatherhood. When we come to the New Testament, the role of father is no less central. Our Savior Jesus had a godly and devoted, devoted father named Joseph. From what we know, Joseph was a good provider and a good role model. And Jesus and his siblings grew up to be well-rounded individuals. So it's very likely that Jesus grew up with a keen eye and sensitivity to the role of father. And that brings me to our text. Our text today is very familiar to us. It is part of one of the telling parables of our Lord Jesus. This parable has been given several different titles. It's been called the prodigal son. It's been called the elder brother. It's been called the loving father. And it's been called the waiting father. For our purposes here today, the last two titles fit this occasion, the loving father and the waiting father. To begin, we know that this father in the parable had two sons. Historically, a great deal of emphasis has been put on the younger of the sons. And I'll start with him, but I will move quickly to the father. Jesus in this parable speaks to the Pharisees and scribes two of the religious sects which were always taking exception to things he said and to his teachings. They also took exception to the warm attitude that Jesus always displayed towards the common person. The Pharisees and scribes were proud and did not like Jesus' compassion and love for the lowly. In our text, Jesus told this parable to answer their criticism that he was receiving, to answer their criticism. They had always been accusing him of receiving sinners and eating with them. And Jesus wanted to respond to that attitude. In the Pharisees and scribes' mind, how could Jesus justify his actions that were so non-traditional? How could he always be taken apart of the underdog? And so Jesus told this parable and replied to that rigid attitude of those protagonists. He said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger son, probably in his late teens or maybe a little older, asked the father one day for his share of the estate. This means that he asked his father for what would have been his share of what he would have inherited upon his father's death. He was premature in his request because his father was still alive. But according to Jewish law, a father could distribute his wealth during his lifetime if he wanted to do so. In this case, it did not appear that he was anxious to do so. But his younger son made the request. Again, in Jewish law at the time, it was perfectly legal for a younger son to ask for his share of the estate and even sell it if he wanted. But it was certainly not a loving thing for the younger son to do, nor was it wise, as we shall see. Since the younger son had an older brother, according to the law of the time, the older brother was entitled to a double portion of the estate, and the younger brother a single portion. Well, whatever the younger brother's share came to be, Jesus in the parable tells us that not long after the young man received his portion, he packed and he set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. This brings us back to his name, the prodigal. The word prodigal means wasteful. He earned 
that title because after receiving his share of the father's estate, he wasted it in wild living. The King James Version of the Bible uses the expression riotous living. When you get the time, read the entire narrative of this impulsive young man in Luke's Gospel account, chapter 15. And now, since our main focus today is on fathers, I want to say here that before the young man left home, his father's heart must have ached as he watched his son receive his inheritance and pack up and leave. And tears must have filled the father's eyes as he watched his son disappear over the horizon. In modern times, I might add, tears have filled many fathers' eyes as they saw their sons and in some cases their daughters leave home and sometimes prematurely. These young people wanted to test their wings, but their wings weren't ready for flight. Again, in the parable, Jesus states that the young man squandered his property and loose living. Much speculation has been voiced as to what form that squandering took. It has been suggested that he whined and dined. He parted hard. He spent money as if there would be no end to the spending of money. But finally in the parable, his money ran out. And we might add, when his money disappeared, his so-called friends disappeared also. In the parable, Jesus states that about that time, when the product has spent everything, a great famine arose in that country and the prodigal began to be in want. All his inheritance was gone, and it hit rock bottom financially. It is assumed, then, that he tried to find employment of some kind, but in this he hit a snag. The only job he could find was that of working for a pig farm. Now, the account does not say that the prodigal was a Jewish young person, but many make this assumption. And if he was, his status now as the feeder of pigs would be the most degrading of occupations for Jews historically actually abhor swine or pigs. They consider them to be absolutely and horribly unclean animals and never to be eaten. But nevertheless, here is the prodigal in a pig pen feeding pigs, and it seems as if that he is just as hungry as they are. How humiliating. But now, according to the parable, this is where the prod prodigal came to himself. He came to himself. He came back to his senses. He realized how low he had fallen, and he got back up. He thought about how good he had had it back home. He was ashamed and remorseful about how he had demanded his share of his father's estate and had wasted it all. And as someone put it, had gone from a palace to a pig pen. So he decided, I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to go back home and tell my father I'm sorry. I'm going to beg him to take me back, not as a son, with all the privileges of a son, but as a servant. And so happily, the young man headed back home. What he didn't know was that his father had never given up on him. His father had agonized over his departure ever since he had left. And no doubt the father prayed for him while he was in that far off country and kept looking for his son's return. Then that day came. In the parable, Jesus states that as the prodigal on his way back got within sight of the father's house, his father saw him. His father had compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. His son was about to make an apologetic statement he had rehearsed, but the father would have none of it. He called to his servants and said, bring quickly the best robe and put on my son. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. 
kill the fatted calf, roast it, and let us celebrate my son's return. My sisters and brothers, this is how the loving and forgiving and kind-hearted father, father received his wayward son back. And as I turn now to where we are today on this Father's Day, I believe we can appreciate in the fathers today the qualities that we've observed in the prodigal son's father of long ago. We appreciate fathers' undying love for their children. We applaud them for their love that exists and persists, persists throughout the life of those they've helped bring into the world. We applaud them for the work and sacrifices they put forth so that their children can have the necessities and material benefits that make life a pleasant experience. We applaud fathers like the prodigal's father for their patience and understanding and even grief when their children insist they must leave the nest even before their untested wings are ready to fly. And when the modern day prodigals find that the far off country is not all that they thought it would be, we applaud fathers for placing a welcome home map on the porch for their wayward children when they return. And now, friends, as I draw this brief sermonic sharing to a close, let me make this connection, if, if I will. Another father, our Heavenly Father, a long time ago, saw his children become rebellious and take their journey into a far country, the far country of sin and separation from God. History shows that humankind for a long time stayed in that far country, wasting their substance in rioting in riotous living. But the Father, Jehovah, Elohim, El Shaddai, our Heavenly Father, never gave up on his wayward children. Sisters and brothers, God was patient. God was long-suffering when his children distanced themselves from him. And in God's case, he sent someone to go after and look for his wayward ones. You and I were included in the wayward ones. Any unsaved fathers were also included in the wayward ones. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the message to all sinful prodigals is your father's waiting. You can go home. The welcome mat is at the door. You can go home. I'll close with this now. William Kirkpatrick voiced the sentiments of all the prodigals who had gone off to the far country, but who realized that it was time to go home. Kirkpatrick said in his famous hymn, Lord, I'm Coming Home, and it goes, I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long have trod. Lord, I'm coming home. I've wasted many precious years. Now I'm coming home. I now repent with bitter tears. Lord, I'm coming home. My soul is sick. My heart is sore. Now I'm coming home. My strength renew. My hope restore. Lord, I'm coming home. And now the chorus, coming home, coming home. No more to roam. Open now thine arms of love. Lord, I'm coming home. And church, I thank God that one day I came home. And if you came home, you thank God that you came home. Amen? Amen. And amen. Brothers and sisters, if you've heard this word, uh, I hope that God has blessed you through it and uh, uh, imp impacted your heart with the realization that, that, that fathers are very special people in time, and we have a very special father in eternity, our Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that uh, if you don't know him, you will seek him. Read the word of God and pray to God that he will, that Jesus will become real in your life, that you will accept him as your Lord and Savior, and that you'll become a part of the family of God. And uh, if, you'd have, if, if you'd have the opportunity, 
come and visit us here at Second Baptist Church on Monroe Street down in the Greek town section of Detroit, Michigan. God bless you. And now, friends, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may he make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.